Hello again. Thanks. Uh, I hope you had a good lunch. Thanks for coming back. We're going into our second session of the day when we'll have a series of uh, projects presented that um, we've, in, you know, we sort of came up with uh, titles for everything to sort of link everything together. There's a little bit uh, of thought into how each of the projects come into conversation with each other. And this one we refer to as working in the landscape, which um, will be, I think, more obvious in some, uh, some than others that seem to make sense. We're going to have uh, five presentations. Uh, we're having a little bit of a slight change from the paper that you might have in front of you and that I'll be moderating and inviting people up uh, through this session so that uh, Megan can focus on, on the presentation and because we do not have Meg McKay with us today. She is ill. Uh, so first, I'm just going to go through who we have here. And first, I'm going to uh, uh, invite Paul uh, Sejus to come up and to talk about uh, Blue Hour. He's laughing because we were talking about pronunciations of last names. But come on up. I'm calling you up. I'm calling you out. All right. I'm going to duck stage right so that we have less long, cro dramatic crosses through it. So take it away. Thanks. What do I do here with this pointer? OK. All right, thanks. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, thanks, Ian. Um, Thanks as well uh, to Toaster Lab in general for the invitation and um, specifically for being able to uh, give you some information about the project and as well as listen to all of your projects because it's been totally fascinating this morning. And so I really want to thank Toaster Lab for that kind of initiative. Um, so my name is Paul Segas. <laughs> I'm a digital sonographer. Uh, I'm also a lecturer at the University of Waterloo in the Department of Communication Arts. Uh, I'm as well a PhD candidate uh, at the School of Arts, Design and Architecture at Aalto University in Finland. Uh, so today, let's see if we can, oh, well that just is unexpected. Great, there we go. Uh, I'd like to speak to you about Blue Hour Virtual Reality or Blue Hour VR created by myself and Joris Vidum who is a researcher and designer of mixed reality theater at the University of Arts in Utrecht. Um, the Blue Hour VR experience as part of the 36Q at the 2019 Prague Quadrennial of Performance Design and Space is an innovative and formative example of a site responsive mixed reality performance design, which blurs the boundaries between performance, spectatorship, and real and virtual environments, piloting interactive virtual reality technology and hybrid environments that blend 360-degree cinematography and real-time 3D graphics. Blue Hour VR drew new lines of experience for participants, placing them at the center of a performance experience, expanding our understanding of scenographic dramaturgies that exist inside, outside, and in between realities. Its artistic impetus was also rooted in a social one, making, well, asking the question, what does it mean to be present in relationship to different shifting ecological spaces and the consequences of the Anthropocene? The initial spatial concept for the Mawa Sports Hall, which you see here, um, which is right next to the Vishta Vishta Praha Palace, uh, was originated by Roman Tardi, who was inspired by light, its potential and mystical influence on the creation um, during a phenomenon known as Blue Hour. This term Blue Hour is a nautical reference to the period of time when we are unable to visually perceive the difference between sea and sky and the line of the horizon simply dissolves. This moment of liminality offers up a moment of seeing, of course, when our normative perceptions of space, time, and self become untethered from the quotidian routines of daily life and in turn offer up new ways of knowing the world around us. The Blue Hour VR experience had the desire to activate the multi-perceptual apparatuses and disrupt the hyper-mediatized and aesthetically barren world of the sports hall by grounding the experience in a highly tactile sand pool, activating the body's sensorium in ways that afford us new ways of experiencing space, time, and our sense of self. 
the physical body of the experiencer moving in space and isolated in light was both central to the external sonography of the sports hall and integral to the internal visual dramaturgy taking place inside the VR experience. Experiencers' bodies in space, space that was somewhere between real and virtual, automatically collapsed the traditional boundaries between spectator and performer. Experiencers were simultaneously dancers and observers, immersive puppets and players, attuned to the centrality of their embodied and bodiless presence. So imagine that from a bright and sunny day in Prague, you walk through a door of an unassuming sports hall into a dark reception area. Walking down a stairway, you are greeted by emerging sounds and haze. At the bottom of the stairs, you see an opening to a huge space filled with moving lights and an environmental soundscape. Entering the space, you see other visitors exploring around pools filled with water and micro-environments, with living plants and other materials. But at each end of the space, a three-story high scaffolding structure is erected on which colored LED strips and video projections show abstract light patterns and moving textures. Then you notice that in some of the pools, people are standing with bare feet in sand, lit by a small spotlight above their heads. They wear a VR helmet, blocking their eyes and ears, holding a lantern-like object in their hands. They seem to be looking and moving around in a space you cannot see or hear. You walk over to have a closer look, and you are invited by a friendly volunteer to sit down in a nearby chair, to take off your shoes, and to be the next person to go into VR. As you stand barefoot to the side of the pool, an attendant then fits a headset over your skull, and you become extremely self-conscious of being watched. Perhaps that's what's prevented you from wanting to try the experience the day before when you visited the Blue Hour. But now you are being dressed and made ready to perform. Your stage fright is interrupted by the attendant who whispers several key instructions. As you look around, you notice the exact replica of the space. The space architecture is replicated one to one with your headset as though you are only wearing a weighty pair of transparent glasses. You take a deep breath and you step off the edge of the pool into the sand. You feel perhaps unstable at first and then you remember being on a beach or in a sandbox or your balance then quickly recalibrates. You reach out and you clasp the acrylic lantern, barely even noticing the incongruities between the virtual space and the real world, or the absence of your arms and hands. Oh, it feels good to hold on to something, real and virtual. As you lift the lantern, the system acknowledges your presence and small sprite-like particles begin to emerge from the lantern, casting light shadows into the space. Almost imperceptibly, the sand pool begins to lift you up and slowly moves you to the center of the space. The sonic quality changes, and you cannot quite discern where the sound originates. You know you are being watched. Your attention is seized by the virtual world. The luminescent sprites seem to be rising upwards, collecting and breaking open the roof to allow a voluminous light to pour through the roof while simultaneously the sand pool begins to rise upwards as the beams of the roof peel away like the bones of a whale opening up and back and eventually falling away endlessly beneath you. The environment around you transforms into the blue hour and four spherical portals emerge from your lantern pinned to each of the cardinal directions which you can explore crouching down and moving towards them in the sand once activated, the portal grows in size to eventually swallow you. Now you are surrounded by an ever-changing 360-degree cinematographic video poem. The video poems lament different aspects of the Anthropocene. They are tethered to the four seasons. Winter contemplates the fragmentation and dematerialization of nature with its increasing presence of technology in our lives. Spring is a plea to consider the seventh generation. Summer laments the impermanence of human systems and the temporality of the organization. Autumn questions the resilience of a forest in a changing climate. 
A soap bubble appears on the horizon slowly growing in size and eventually it absorbs you. The sudden noise of a Zamboni, a particularly Canadian thing, uh, engulfs you and it takes you back to a hockey arena, the original Mawa Sports Hall, and it jolts you out of this dream like reverie and soon you find yourself back where you sta were standing, except that now it seems to be drizzling and there is moss under your feet and, well, it's a different place. You seem to have made it back to the same space, but sometime in the future, when nature begins to reclaim the human construct of a building. Each experiencer interacted with the sand pool in different ways. Some stood still, rooting themselves to the center of the pool and gazed out forward in a direction only, while others moved around the pool, looked here and there, some crawling, some sitting, some even perching on the ledge, trying to get a glimpse of what might be underneath the pool. Of the approximately 500 people that experienced the Blue Hour VR, few had trouble with either motion sickness, vertigo, or those that did repeated well, repeatedly came back the next day to try and overcome their body's perceptual blockages. We found in conversation with many of the experiences that they felt deeply connected to their bodies despite there being no visual representation of their bodies. Often they would say that this was strange but not destabilizing or off-putting. In fact, the deep sense of embodiment that experiencers had made us wonder what perceptual apparatuses they used to seamlessly move between the virtual and the real. As with any theatrical performance, the experience of each person was vastly different, but one thing was common to all. After removing the headset, each person was transformed, felt most often was a kind of joy or exaltation, as though they had experienced some profound realization. Often the experiencer needed to describe the journey to an attendant or immediately comment on something that they had discovered. We were struck by the overwhelming need to communicate and share the story of their journey and the act recounted, what they experienced to someone else, someone real. They seemed to be a very necessary part of what was to bring them back from the virtual. Being in relation with other humans also seemed to be necessary, a necessary bridge back from the absence of their virtual bodies. We also noticed that people seemed to be deeply present in their senses and emotions during the experience. Perhaps this was induced by a feeling of privacy that came from wearing the VR headset, which might afford the kind of conditions whereby people feel permission to let down their guard and become more affected by their emotions. Some people wanted to be left alone after the experience and to contemplate in silence while watching the next person go through the experience. There were a few that were moved to tears and who could not explain why. One woman from Trinidad explained that the experience made her think about her home by the sea and how long it might be before she returns home. For another, the absence of a visual representation of her body was troubling, while for another it was barely noticeable because of the extent to which the images and animations felt material and made her feel extremely present in her body. And then there was the six-year-old, who after spending several minutes with the headset on, darting here and there and up and down and everywhere, as you would all know, shouted out to her mother in a moment of pause and said, Mama, do I still exist? We would like to propose that all of these people, including the six-year-old, we're not only exploring very sensory experiences of embodiment, but we're also exploring the intermedial spaces of performance, oscillating between spectator and performer in deep collaboration with the hypermedia of VR. Peter Bonish describes intermediality as an effect created in the perception of observers that is triggered by performance and the confluence of media and machines used in performance. This is a very productive way, I think, that we can all think about how VR, with its incredible potential to refresh our perception, can inject new momentum into theater and performance, which in turn can open up new dramaturgical potentials and scenographic opportunities. We feel that we are at the beginning of a profoundly exciting moment in performance creation.
especially as we grapple for new dramaturgical strategies and language that can help us create new modes of representation and new ways of seeing and knowing the world around us. Merci, thank you. You'd think that we had an A discuss names on the lunch break and B hadn't known each other for years. I apologize. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to make two notes that I had notes to make before and I realized that I was saying Paul's last name wrong. Uh, one is that uh, though not articulated on anything else, we realized that people might like to connect and uh, a hashtag has been suggested. So if you are posting about things that happen, uh, the, uh, the hashtag that has been suggested is MRPS, Mixed Reality Performance Symposium 01. And I think that will thinking on the fly here, end up sequentially numbering all the following ones from that. So when we come to our later symposium, uh, our next one, it'll be zero two. The other one is that uh, you can expect at the break to have a coffee refresh. So I know that we were running low there, but we do have them servicing the coffee as we speak right now. So something to look forward to beyond uh, our next few presentations. Uh, I may stay close by to help with some of the technical answers for that, but I'm going uh, for this next project, having uh, had the pleasure of collaborating with uh, Tashina Parker for the last almost two years uh, on the Groundworks project, but I'll invite her to talk about uh, how that project has come together, and uh, I won't go too far. All right. Hi, um, my name is Tashina Parker. And I wanna say thank you to Paul for presenting that. That was really, really cool. It makes me wanna get in there. Um, so uh, um, I also want to acknowledge um, that I'm honored to be on occupied territory known as Toronto and as a guest here to the original indigenous people of this land. Um, I come from California. I live in Yolamu, otherwise known as San Francisco and I'm from Awani, otherwise known as Yosemite. I'm from Southern Sierra Miwok tribe of Yosemite, Mono Lake Paiu, and Pomo from Santa Rosa area. And I work with Dancing Earth, which is an indigenous contemporary dance um, group that is based in Santa Fe and also in San Francisco. And I'm here on behalf of Rulong Tongan, who is the artistic director who is also working in Arizona right now to prep a show for ASU Gamage that we have in January. So um, I want to say thank you to Ian also um, and Toaster Lab for, being, for bringing this project really to Dancing Earth and to kind of stepping us into this whole new um, I, like tech reality that I think sometimes is elusive to indigenous communities, especially because we live in traditional ways and we really highly value traditional practices. So as we see technology and indigenous um, tradition come together, there's a whole new frontier that we're experiencing. And a lot of the people who are involved in this are the younger generations and the older people just really can't even understand what the concepts are and also are not really interested in knowing them. Um, so here we have um, some pictures with um, one of our collaborators um, on the, in this picture on your left, um, Ross Kadi, who is Pomo um, to Santa Rosa area in California. And he's also, he's very traditional and also very contemporary. He's a musician as well as working with youth and him fully engaged in his native community. You see him there in his traditional regalia. And he worked with us in Dancing Earth to create part of this project that was used in virtual reality um, of sacred place. So combining virtual reality and 3D um, on VR headset, we can take people back to the sacred space in which they are indigenous to or use as a learning tool to learn about. Um, we worked with youth in the area. A lot of the youth are, um, they know of the uh, they know of the concept of this, but often don't have access to it because um, a lot of this stuff is um, just financially out of reach. Um, a lot of the communities that they come from, um, the, they attend schools that don't have resources that they can get access to this sort of technology. So it's also introducing the youth to these ideas. 
Um, we worked in a theatrical performance aspect, and one of the one of the women that we worked with, her name is Bernadette Smith, and the stage picture on there with the fabric draped across is um, a dance storytelling of a of a story that she wrote about the tan oak acorn, which is um, threatened right now by sudden oak death and also um, just by clear cutting in the area. And acorn is a sacred food of the California native people. So she had written a story that she called a play and um, we really helped her, Dancing Earth really helped her to turn that into a performance piece that was a, a original story of her coming from her tribal people and also an advocacy story about environmental awareness and um, the need to protect this traditional sacred food. So when Ian came with us, um, a lot of the work, you see the VR camera there um, or the 3D camera there, a lot of the work that we do takes a lot of groundwork, and that's why it's called Groundworks. And working within indigenous communities, the timeline is really, really long. Um, oftentimes, you have to be somebody, you have to know somebody very intimately who is um, integrated into the community, part of the community, in order to gain access to these stories and places. Um, a lot of the sacred places are places that they don't want people to know about, that um, you know, we don't want people necessarily to be able to have access to, but at the same time, there's a necessity for educating people within our own communities and also the wider communities of why these places are sacred and should be preserved. Um, so a lot of the work that we do is we're really working within community to integrate the ideas, but also to make personal connections and to gain trust. So there's a lot of talk about protocols or what I like to call the good way or what Native people call the good way. And a lot of times we use the word protocol as how do we enter these spaces in a good way? And how do we talk to community so that we gain trust? Um, and this is a photo that's on top of um, a sacred mountain of the Wapo territory. Another woman that we work with, her name is Desiree Harp. She's a community activist within California and a traditional singer. And we went on a hike up to the top of this mountain and you see the cell tower up there. And that was part of her story of this sacred place is that a lot of native sacred places are being taken over by um, technology and also in some way, you know, defaced and they change the way that we interact with them. So um, from this location point, we also did a VR um, or a 3D, 3D filming with Ian and Toaster Lab and she talked about this sacred place and um, what that tower means to her people and what that means to how we change sacred places with how we interact with them in, um, in our modern lives. Um, here's us at the top and Really, a lot of this stuff is used as an educational tool for our own people as well. So I'm native to California, but I've never been to this sacred mountain. I didn't know about it. And I live probably 45 minutes south of there in San Francisco. So um, some of the applications that we're talking about using within native community are how do we use these as learning tools? So part of that, um, <clears throat> in working with the community that we work with of indigenous people is um, really sourcing that within the community. So asking them, you know, how could they see this, these sort of applications used? And part of that is in um, an applica uh, you know, a mobile phone application as a learning tool. And one of the people that we work with in California, her name is Canyon Sayers Roods, and she's also um, a community activist, but she's, she's very integrated into the tech world as well. And um, the people that I have mentioned are younger native people, um, and they help us to um, really kind of see what the ideas are out there, what ideas can go, could fly within their own community, and how to indigenize this sort of tech from the point of view of, in, of indigenous people so that it's coming directly sourced within the community. And um, some of these ways that we've come up with are using it as a tool to gamify language. So in some of the applications, like the mountain that you saw before, or some of the locations that you saw before, or um, here at the bottom of the screen is Alcatraz Island, where we did a performance, is that you can learn this, this, the original name of the place, 
and learn to repeat that name and learn language learning in order to get access to some of the VR contents. So that could be some of the 3D filming that we're doing or a dance performance that we have created with um, Native people. Um, and really the possibilities are endless. And the goal of this is to, in the longer term, is to build a whole team of indigenous people who are contributing to this. So one of the things that I, I see really lacking in um, the resources that we have right now are um, somebody who's indigenous within the community who knows the back end part of the coding. And that's something that a lot of us don't really understand who are not as tech savvy as all of the people here, um, but really have the cultural knowledge to be able to know what content we would like to have on there. And then also how to present the content. Um, some of the ways that Dancing Earth is using the application right now, like I said, the timeline is really long. So right now, our, you know, we don't have anything really showy as far as the tech aspect goes. Um, Ian has worked a lot to um, edit and um, produce the film that he has done with, uh, with our communities. And, um, but right now, the way that we show it is engaging within the Native community. So last weekend in San Francisco, we hosted a show. And at that show, we had the virtual reality goggles and some of the sacred places that we had done with, these, with the dancers that were with us. And we use that as part of a way to introduce it to the Native communities that we work with and know. And um, if, if you know Native community, um, people know, you know Indian country is small. So it might seem like, you know, here we are in Canada or here we are um, in the United States, but actually when you start to get involved in Native community, we, we all really know each other. And it's only one or two degrees separation before we start hearing about the things that everybody else is working on. So the, um, the, the interest really moves like wildfire in that way. Um, some of the future artistic applications could be to um, and have more immersive reality that engages sacred place with dance. And I think that's the next frontier with how Dancing Earth would like to interact with this. And that's still something that as um, indigenous people we struggle with. How do we create, connect, how do we connect um, technology and traditional forms of art? And dance on stage or dance like within a roundhouse or within our communities is a traditional form. So how can we merge those together in a way that feels authentic to, to us? So I want to say thank you. Um, that was, I think, all I have to say. And we'll probably comment on the tech part later when we do the panel. Come back with another mic. Uh, thank you, Tashima. Uh, one of the people who actually is uh, contributing a bit to that, this is by way of a segue, who is also with us in San Francisco, is Jacob Needs Wiki, uh, who has a number of projects. Uh, he's also uh, leading or a part of the leadership of another digital strategy fund grant, which we're hoping will intersect because we have a lot of similar, uh, similar desires as to sort of outcomes for that, which is the cohort project. Uh, and I'll invite him to come and talk about his work right now. I know. This is why I'm exiting this side, to cut down a mile on the Hi. Uh, I'm going to be showing a video, but for the tech crew, we don't need to take the lights down. Uh, and I'll just be sort of asking you to play it and then pause at a certain point. Um, my name's uh, Jacob Nijwiecki, or Nidzwiki, uh, is also fine. Um, I'm a choreographer, uh, filmmaker, and uh, software developer slash creative technologist. So the, the easier way for me to say that is I work in movement and media and code. Um, I have my own practice, which largely relates around movement and choreography. Uh, and I do a lot of work with uh, theater and dance companies to facilitate uh, ideas they have around ways to use technology. Um, the project that I'm going to be showing and talking a bit about is called Jackeries. Um, it premiered in 2013 uh, and was remounted in 2014 and 15. Uh, the first two instances happened in Toronto uh, on the Ryerson campus and then as part of Summerworks on Queen West. Um, and then we took it on tour uh, to, the to the Filmgate Transmedia Festival in Miami. Um, Jackeries was uh, a show for uh, six performers and about 20 to 30 audience members. Uh, audience members uh, split into small groups following performers, and then performers came together for sort of duets and ensemble scenes. Um, the idea was really to take people through uh, parts of a city that you don't get to see. Uh, I had been doing a lot of uh, parkour training, and part of that ethic is interesting routes between places in urban environments. Um, 
so uh, we put together a bit of a, uh, a clothesline of narrative that we could hang these scenes off of, uh, which was sort of an, an esp a heist with John le Carré elements, so sort of a political espionage heist story. Um, and really the, uh, the uh, actually, can we start, can we hit the video now? And we'll just watch a minute or two and then come back. So I'm gonna narrate a bit as we go. Uh, this is our Miami tour. So we've got about 10 people standing uh, who have followed, five have followed one of these performers, five have followed the other, and they're standing uh, and watching this at close range. Um, one of the elements of Jackery's is we, we license and uh, look for permission for as few of the spaces as possible. Uh, so we aim to use public spaces, uh, and we aim to use those in a non-exclusive way. Uh, so we might be in one location for no more than five minutes. And if you've ever watched skateboarders or parkour uh, tressers train, that's kind of the way they move through the landscape, is almost like grazing animals that don't want to spend too long in one location because then security shows up. Um, the uh, one of the interesting parts of working on this show for me was from the beginning, uh, there's a trap of site-specific performance, which is that uh, when it's good, it engages really deeply with its site, with its location, but that means it also can't go anywhere and becomes very hard to remount or to make accessible to a wider audience. Um, so when we were deciding on the, the locations for these individual scenes, uh, we looked for spaces of common urban infrastructure. Um, so essentially, can, what can we find in any city? Uh, fire exits or fire stairwells, uh, jersey barriers like this concrete barrier. Uh, in Miami, we used a low uh, retaining wall. Um, roof decks, uh, back alleys, uh, graffiti, walls with graffiti on them. So we were really looking uh, to find individual locations that we could uh, reproduce in different cities in different configurations, and that worked out quite nicely. Um, the other element that we started to appreciate more and more is that uh, for a show that was a heist story, the process of uh, mounting the show becomes actually pulling off a heist. <laughs> uh, so the process of scouting different locations, deciding on routes, uh, and coordinating everybody's activities uh, actually becomes quite similar to the story we're telling. And we always, we, we sort of started to really enjoy that process. Um, technologically, uh, what facilitated the show uh, was an idea that I had, which is that I, this is the first site-specific work I had made. And I really wanted to be able to bring along the technology that I had access to in a theater. Uh, sound, we can pause there actually. Thanks. Uh, sound cues, video cues, uh, comms, uh, synchron like time, man time management. Uh, we wanted to bring those along with us. Um, and so I, I wrote a custom app uh, that allowed us to uh, cue sound, to cue on-screen video, um, and to cue augmented reality uh, video in. Um, in the context of this show. So uh, at the time that I made that, I thought, oh, I would really like for other creators to be able to use this tool as well. Um, and so we engineered the, first ver engineered the first version of the app to make that possible. Uh, in 2013, two weeks before our show, Apple rejected our app submission uh, because it could enable music piracy. Um, because queuing audio on multiple devices in a synchronous way uh, could in theory lead to playing one, buying a song once and playing it for many people. Um, we've heard of speakers, so I didn't quite understand <laughs> why this was such a challenge. Um, but that, that, that idea of, wow, this feels like a really, um, a really useful uh, set of capabilities uh, that I don't want to keep to myself um, has, is actually what led to this, the project that Ian mentioned, Cohort, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end in like the last minute or two. Um, Let's keep going on the video. Uh, so this is a scene where two, uh, two scenes are happening simultaneously in different places. We have one scene on a rooftop, you can see in the tiny little corner there. Um, so we have uh, essentially two characters assembling uh, a, s a sniper rifle. <laughs> it sounds a bit odd out of context. Um, while two other characters are meeting um, at, a, in a, at, a, at a park bench that's actually within a sight line of the roof deck. Um, and so we were, we were really trying to um, create a cinematic experience of multiple locations at the same time. Our ability to put cues on, we can pause there, our ability to put cues on the audience devices meant that 
they could be watching one thing live it, with their actual eyeballs and could be also keeping tabs on another scene happening simultaneously. And so they could sort of do their own cross-cutting back and forth. Um, that also was really useful to cover transitions. Um, we had sort of one to three minute walks between different locations. Uh, and so we used uh, what's happening somewhere else right now as a way to offer the people who aren't who weren't interested in just following a performer, which I think is kind of, for, for a lot of people, that's a really interesting experience. Um, for people who are more media hungry, they were able to sort of fill those walks with screen-based content, <laughs> um, and uh, which sort of expanded the, the world of the show. It made it feel a lot bigger. Um, let's keep going on the video. Um, I said that the show was inspired by, by parkour. Uh, this is one chase scene. Um, so the audience is effectively running behind me uh, as I beckon them to follow um, and staying at ground level. <laughs> uh, the, the ability to have an, have an app and to queue content through the app also helped us a lot with accessibility. Um, so we were able to segment people with different appetites or capacities for movement into different groups. So that when I beckon that group, come on, run with me, we have to keep up, um, we've actually uh, place people in that group who are capable of that and have that appetite, um, have, that, have that sort of desire. Um, and, we've, and we crafted other experiences for people in wheelchairs or for, for older people like my dad who came and couldn't keep up with that one. Um, I'm gonna let this video keep going. Uh, this is a, the, I think the end of this video demo section, um, which shows a bit of how we used augmented reality. Um, I had done a lot of projection design in the past um, and so the approach was, let's take material that we might have projected onto a scrim in front of a performer um, and project it, uh, essentially reproject it using augmented reality. Um, so the performer's live in front of a real wall, but all these overlays, uh, which were inspired by cheesy hacker movies from the 80s, um, are happening uh, only on screen. And so we have a narrative beat here where the character uh, essentially like, where the, the live performer is gathering information uh, and collecting sort of location and, appearance uh, so they can follow this other character. Um, we also got a nice moment at the end where we got to make them disappear. Um, this relies on the performer having a killer deadpan because of course if you look without your phone, they are still standing there totally visible. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to take the last minute or two of this and uh, talk a little bit about the, the project that I'm working on now, um, which aims to make those capabilities of queuing, sound, video, uh, flashlight on and off, uh, vibration with the um, and making, making it possible to integrate those into theatrical experiences really easily. Um, so the, the main URL, which is not going to be up on a slide, but if you are curious to hear more about this, um, cohort.rocks. Uh, C-O-H-O-R-T dot rocks. Uh, and you can, f it's, uh, the main get in touch link on there is through Twitter, that's my Twitter. Um, so uh, I'm also here, at, here for the rest of the day and you can come up to me and we can trade contact info. Um, the idea is, as Andrew talked about at the beginning of the day, um, to take these tools that are useful on individual projects and find ways to um, continue to advance the work on them between projects <laughs> um, so that we can, as a community, uh, build our tools um, and share those with each other so that, we're not, so that we're not starting from scratch every time we have a technologically involved idea. Um, so currently, uh, we've done our first open source release, uh, which is largely existing code around being able to queue media and uh, events on audience devices. Um, we've had uh, five different companies uh, that have partnered with us and uh, have have actually created full productions with these um, with this with these tools, um, and we're heading into a stage of work where we're trying to now um, make the tools more broadly useful and uh, to document them so that they're really easy to pick up and do something with. Um, so uh, I'll be happy to answer questions on that later, uh, either on the panel or individually. You can come up to me. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Jacob. Um, continuing on and, and continuing to work on, on trails, I'm gonna ask Adrian Mackey, who's up from Philadelphia, uh, in a collaboration that we've been doing uh, there between Toaster Lab and her company, Swim Pony, uh, to talk a little bit about the project Trail Off uh, and its multitudes. It contains multitudes. Multitudes. Yes. <laughs> 
Um, all right, is everybody doing okay? That post-lunch rush is in there for me. Um, so, uh, Swim Pony is my company. Um, it is uh, a vehicle basically to uh, design immersive experiences um, that for me invite audiences into um, curious questions about the world. Um, so I'm really interested in how we understand stories in the context of place and the present moment. Um, so just to give you some background of other ways we've done that before hooking up with Toaster Lab, this is a show called The Giant Squid, which I created in collaboration with my husband's company, The Berserker Residence. Um, and we called it a cryptozoology horror comedy. Um, for those of you who are familiar uh, with H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythology, um, the squid is not a squid. Um, and it was a piece uh, in which we created sort of Steve Zizou meets Stephen King um, and this team of terrible uh, marine biology wannabes um, show up and give a science lecture demonstration um, that we toured to actual science lecture halls around the Philadelphia region. Um, and we would retrofit the performance space and of course at the end uh, the Cthulhu demon uh, attacks the audience. Um, this is a piece we built uh, in conjunction with Drexel's entrepreneurial game studio called War of the Worlds Philadelphia. Um, and in it, uh, we cast audiences as rebel fighters against an alien force called the forgetting, which was a metaphor for gentrification. And to fight the forgetting, audiences would take a mobile app around the area of the community center the performance took place in and gather stories in danger of being lost in order to fight the forgetting uh, from attacking the city. This piece, uh, The End, was one that Ian actually was a beta tester of. Um, it was a 30-day uh, alternate reality game that explored uh, personal fears of mortality. So each day, players would text in to a phone number and undergo a small reflective prompt, like walking through a cemetery or writing your own obituary, and then have a conversation with uh, The End, who was essentially a manifestation of death. Um, the end was staffed by a team of live performers and we had these dossiers on players and essentially it was just a free form exploration on how do you narrativize what winning life means to you. Um, uh, I'm really into trails this year so we're actually concurrently exploring an analog card game at 23 environmental centers throughout the Delaware River watershed. Um, where we use sense and memory-based prompts just to get people into different relationship to the environment. But the project that we're working on with Toaster Lab is Trail Off. Um, so you might recognize a couple people in that uh, photo there. Um, Trail Off is going to be a transmedial walking performance. Um, it's a collaboration between Swim Pony, Toaster Lab and the Pennsylvania Environmental Council, um, and it'll be a free to download mobile app that'll premiere in June of 2020. Uh, and the core of the project is 10 original stories that are intended to be listened to as you walk a roughly two mile route on one of Philadelphia's circuit trails. Uh, they are original stories uh, written by artists from the region who are um, kind of a unique combination of like really artistically rigorous and amazing creators that also have really substantive connections to communities that are traditionally underserved by environmental programming. So audiences uh, will be able to access the app um, and using GPS triggering, we're gonna link these stories that have been created specifically to be heard on the trails um, as you walk through them. So it's kind of creating the sense of an immersive theater experience, but in a much more accessible way, while simultaneously sort of disrupting that sort of traditional um, like NPR beige idea of who is out on a nature trail. Um, and part of the aim is really to think about like how do we imagine these spaces from the unique perspective of these writers. So for example, um, there's a suburban trail out uh, in an area called Chester Valley that we've partnered a spoken word poet who is a trans-Latinx 22-year-old. Um, not necessarily the traditional uh, person you imagine on that space. And he's created this incredible walk um, with Aztec gods uh, to the afterworld, right? So really sort of rethinking like what are the stories of nature uh, that we imagine when we walk through these places. 
There are some uh, opportunities for little Easter eggs, you know, using phone data of time um, or date or weather to also sort of increase that sense of liveness. After you walk the trail, uh, the app interface will shift into sort of a bonus content feature with inner uh, podcast style interview with the author um, to get some background about how they came up with the story, as well as historic uh, and environmental content um, that maybe just didn't make it into the app story. Uh, some of you might recognize that person. Um, we built the uh, sort of groundwork for the app through a series of workshops uh, funded by the Network of Ensemble Theaters. The first one we did was a narrative workshop, really just to sort of ask questions in a curious way about like what kinds of stories work in this format and what is it about like being in a place, hearing a thing, having your brain, listening to music um, that is unique to that delivery medium. Um, and also, what does it mean to cast a listener in this kind of a story? We also had an audio-specific workshop where we sort of looked at technical tricks and tools to, to share with the authors we eventually onboarded and tried some of these stories out on actual sites that we were using to see what worked and didn't work. Uh, and we finished with a technical residency um, where we started piloting the actual mechanics of what we were going to do. Uh, we ended by synthesizing all of that stuff into this amazing dramaturgical packet, which we could then hand to people sort of as a lessons learned based on the year's worth of research we'd done. Concurrently to all that, um, I was reaching out across Philadelphia, basically to find any artist who would talk to me uh, about this project. Um, and after an initial email conversation, I sat down and had coffee with over 100 people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, to sort of underscore the idea that this project was going to be a conversation and a collaboration from the get-go. So many of the artists who applied and didn't get selected still really impacted the process because having that conversation helped me learn a lot about what people did and didn't know about coming into this format. Uh, these are nine of the ten authors we selected. One hasn't sat for her portrait yet. Um, uh, and if you go onto Swim Pony's website, you can learn about them. They are astonishing uh, human beings. Uh, and in March, we had a residency that Justine came and co-facilitated, where we sort of launched them into their residency on their trail. We didn't make them live on the trail for the three months they worked on it. <laughs> um, We've also been working with uh, graphic designer Maria Shaplin to sort of create the look and feel of the app interface. And over the last month and a half, our sound designer Mike Kiley and I have been recording the actors finally with these final scripts uh, in the studios and then uh, pairing all that audio onto maps and spreadsheets to actually go into the interface that's um, currently being built. So for my last little bit of time here, um, it is not, I can't take you to the Heinz Wildlife Refuge outside of Philadelphia, but um, I can share just a little bit of a radio edit that we've put together of one of the stories uh, that's uh, complete. So if, uh, after I read this little summary, um, if you'll cue that to like 1430 in the track. So this story is called The Land Remembers. It is by uh, poet Jacob Winterstein, um, and it takes place at the Heinz Wildlife Refuge, which sits next to the area of Eastwick in southwest Philadelphia. The summary is, in the 1950s, as part of urban renewal, Philadelphia displaced over 8,000 residents from Eastwick, AKA the Meadows, thought to be one of Philly's only harmoniously integrated neighborhoods, at a time when many racist housing policies were legal. In The Land Remembers, Nick, AKA Nickel, AKA Abe, reminisces about his last days living there. So you can go ahead and play that. These are some images from our workshop at the space. We stopped paddling right here and just let the raft float. It barely moved. I looked back towards the meadows at the part of the pond I imagine has always looked the same. Ox looked the other way, towards the airport. He wondered if flying felt like sitting on a raft, if sitting on the air felt like sitting on the water. I asked Ox why the pond was his favorite part of the park. He said it's like an outdoor movie theater that never plays the same picture twice. 
like the time we saw two bald eagles attack that big bird with a fish in its claws. Or the time we saw a bird as big as a plane take off from behind a clump of cattails. Or the time we saw a bird that wasn't even bigger than my fist chase a hawk over the lake and past the trees. The last time Ox and me were here, we laid so still on this raft that the small birds forgot we were here and landed right next to us. That day, when the sun went and hid behind the trees, Ox picked up his paddle. It felt like he just had to pull the paddle through the water twice to take us from the middle of the pond all the way back to the banks. Let's go straight ahead down by the creek and see if Mr. Johnson comes by to fish today. And you can cut it there. That's it. Thanks. Leave the remote. That's necessary. All right. So before we come into the conversation, uh, uh, I'm going to invite Megan Byrne up to the stage. Uh, uh, Megan works with uh, Imaginative uh, and does the digital programming. Uh, the festival was just last week, uh, so she's, she's perhaps still recovering a little bit. But she's going to be talking a little bit about uh, uh, a, a, a document, which she has copies of available for sale, right? Uh, for on screen uh, protocol and pathways. Yeah, thank you. Tanzi, Megan Bernasikasan, Apatawako Sisan, Hamilton, Ontario, Nichun. Hi, my name is Megan Byrne. I am Apatawako Sisan, which is the Cree word for Métis, and I come from Hamilton, Ontario. And today, I don't have a really cool project to show you, even though everything here has been so awesome so far, but what I do have to talk about is a document that Imaginative and the Indigenous Screen Office, together with a large cohort of advisors and cultural experts, got together to deal with a pressing problem that has been going on since, I guess, the beginning of uh, stories being taken from Indigenous people. Sorry. So this was supported in part by Ontario Creates, the CMF, Creative BC, the, um, the NFB, Telefilm, and the InSpirit Foundation. So this came out of a conversation that happened in 2017 at a hot doc summit. Uh, I wasn't there for the conversation, but essentially it was, uh, why do we keep allowing our stories to be mined the same way that they have mined our land and taken the oil from the ground. And it was kind of a striking point where people realized that, yes, in fact, this is happening in Indigenous communities that just like the land had been taken, just like the, the resources had been taken, now stories and people's histories were starting to be taken. Uh, so this was done over about three years. Uh, there were very many people involved. These aren't even all the people who were involved in the making of this. Uh, but it was inspired and directed by the indigenous artists, filmmakers, and creatives that sort of had brought up the problem in the first place. Uh, you probably all know about Jesse Wente, uh, and if you don't, he is uh, an amazing speaker, writer, and also is the director of the Indigenous Screen Office. Uh, and he talks about native sovereignty and narrative sovereignty. And that is something that is a term we've started to use now when it talks about it's not enough to just you know, own our place. We need to own our own stories. We need to be the ones who make and tell and share our stories in the way that are good for us. Uh, and then I can just read what he says. When I talk about narrative sovereignty, what I'm really talking about is the ability of the nations to have some measure of control over the stories that are told about themselves. Throughout the entire history of filmmaking, the overwhelming majority of stories told about indigenous peoples, both fictional and documentary, have been told by non-indigenous people. And this is something that I also bring up at a lot of events. So I myself am a game maker at Imaginative. I work as the coordinator for digital and interactive works, both in the festival and in our institute. And one thing that I say at my talks is that essentially every understanding we have about what is indigenous, what looks indigenous, what feels indigenous has been curated 
by non-Indigenous people. So the idea of Indigenous authenticity has not actually been created in an authentic way, one would say even, and that in fact it plays on a lot of tropes and a lot of stereotypes that continue even to this day. Uh, so because uh, indigenous is kind of a catch-all, just in the way European is a catch-all, uh, one of the things when people are like, oh, we're working on an indigenous project, and I'm like, okay, with who? Uh, because to say indigenous is the same as saying European. You wouldn't say I'm working on a European project, you would say I'm working on this project with the French, or I'm working on this project with the Italians. So it's the same thing for us. Uh, and we also had to recognize and respect that in this document, that this document couldn't be a catch-all. So in fact, it is not a what to do, it's a how to do. Um, so there's nothing in this document that tells you what you should be doing in terms of literally talking to a group. What it is, in fact, is more like a workbook. So I'm just gonna go briefly over how to use this. Uh, so the great thing about this document, so there's a printed document which comes in English and French. So in the same document, it is fully bilingual and has been double, triple checked for French accuracy. Uh, we also have free PDFs on the Imaginative and also I believe on the Indigenous Screen Office website. So the first section is on how you use the protocols, so in which situations they would be used, um, why would you want to have them, why would you be thinking about using them. Mostly this is in context with are you thinking about a project going forward with an indigenous group or an indigenous story or even about an indigenous person that may be deceased? Uh, so it talks about why would you want to use this? The second section talks about how you implement the protocols. Uh, so it goes into once you have your protocols, once you've made them, therefore, how will you now implement them? And one of the big things that I always bring up over this is you can't do this after you've already put together your prototype. I have had as, you know, as somebody who's kind of a bit of a lightning rod for indigenous digital projects, I have had people come to me and be like, oh, we have this really cool project, uh, we'd like to implement protocols. And I was like, okay, what, where are you at? And almost always they're already at the prototype phase, and in some cases they are already seeking funding. Uh, at that point, it's too late. So one of the things that we do bring up a lot is, are you okay with hearing no? And you should be okay with hearing no. And if you're not okay with hearing no, then you need to stop the project where you're at. Uh, and if you do hear no, can you strip out the offensive material to the, the community that you're talking with? And if you can strip it out, why is it there in the first place? So these are kind of things that come up in the protocols that you should be thinking from day one. Uh, it also is important to note that the protocols are not sort of a one and done. Everything that you do with an indigenous community needs to be for life. Uh, and if that is too heavy of a responsibility for you, then it probably shouldn't be done. Uh, so one of the things in here we also have the appendix is on understanding worldviews. So like I said, indigenous kind of covers a huge umbrella of terms. So we also point out how you need to really know about the group that you're working with and that you're talking about. And again, it's why it has to be a lifelong relationship and it has to start before the project's even at the prototyping phase. Uh, it goes into mostly Canadian, uh, but this can be used across uh, the globe, it just you're going to have to do a lot of research about who you're talking to. Uh, and then we also have community resources in here, and again, this is very Canadian based, but again, that's because it was funded and done by uh, Indigenous artists in Canada. But overall, everything in here can be used for almost any screen-based project, but also any project that involves any Indigenous community that could be arts-based. So if you're doing theater, there's no reason why you couldn't have protocols in place. Anytime you are taking from a community, and even if you don't consider that taking, you do have to understand that there are Indigenous ways of owning things. And that those things, even though a person or a family may own something, the community could have right to override. Or a community could say it's okay, but the family has rights to that story or that thing, and they can override. So these are things that you have to understand going into these groups, and that's something that the protocols help develop as a base for any artistic organization or any co uh, company. Uh, so we do want to 
state that these are not a rigid guideline. Uh, it is sort of like a workbook, much in the same way you would learn how to do accounting. The guides is sort of like learn how to make your own protocols, learn how to use your own protocols. Uh, also, it needs to fit with the group that you're working with and fit with you. Like, this is a conversation and it is a relationship. This isn't just a one-way street in either case. Uh, you know, it's better not to think of it as like, I'm paying you money and I get a thing. It's more like, hey, we're entering into a friendship. So these will grow as time goes on. Um, and then I kind of already went into the intent over the whole thing. And I can talk about that more in the panel. Um, but if you'd like to order a copy, uh, you can do so online. Uh, you can also do through Imaginative. I also have about 10 copies available for sale. The hard copy is $60 each, but the PDF is available online for free. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Um, I'm going to invite our speakers back up to the stage, and we'll have a conversation right over here. We'll get uh, our mics out in, in just a moment. Um, while people are transitioning, um, if there's something, we're going to open up to questions. I've got a couple to lead with, but if you're thinking about questions, I would invite you to take a moment, maybe turn to the person to your right or left, and perhaps discuss those while we get ourselves settled. I'll give you a, a moment while the, the mics come out. And I still have, ah, one is hot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, everyone. It's really fantastic to hear. Thanks. No matter, no matter what I do to your last name. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, we talked about it actually. The the, the, the two that, I, that that I got corrected are the ones that we talked about immediately before I came out. It was fun. Um, I have a couple of uh, I have a couple of questions to start us off, and then we'll we'll take uh, questions because we've got uh, a decent amount of time uh, for that. Uh, in the no, in in sort of all of the projects, there's a question uh, about accessibility, whether or not it's the technology, the content, um, uh, the, how how you work. Uh, with either technology or content that is going into a project. And I, I'm wondering if I could uh, ask you sort of, sort of each, especially when you're, when you're integrating technology into work, what, uh, what opportunities and limitations present themselves by committing to make work accessible? Can you define accessible? <laughs> I can define it in a number of ways. Uh, um, so in, in terms of, let's start with a, it as a technology question. Insofar as technology that people ha actually have access to, um, that is something that I think many of the projects, uh, that, that those who are working with specific like pieces of hardware have ranged from like trying to build it and uh, trying to build something that will work on as many mobile devices as possible through working through dedicated hardware. We made a little bit of a discussion about how this creates like a strain on, on trying to move some, some things forward uh, when hardware becomes hard to scale. Um, yeah, go for it, Jacob. I had, a, I had a really interesting experience uh, when we presented Jackery's at Summerworks. Um, we did our preview show and we were at that point relying on I had managed to sort of uh, get four devices that covered, so the cast was fully covered, and I also cast people who ha owned iPhones <laughs> um, because we couldn't afford to buy them for everybody. Uh, but that left the audience uh, reliant on devices they brought from home or that they owned. Um, and we had a producer from, I think, Metro Morning, uh, the CBC show, come to our one of our previews, and, and they said, well, I'd love to share this on the show, but... Um, you're, you're walling off your experience, the experience you're offering from anybody who doesn't have an iPhone, and so we can't really promote that. And I kind of looked at it and I went, okay, feedback taken. Inside, I'm thinking, we are poor artists ourselves. <laughs> how are we supposed to <laughs> buy 20 iPhones and make, like, how, how can it be our job to solve that, pro like, that problem when we don't have, we, we don't have the resources either? Um, so that's, that's been an ongoing struggle, uh, I think. Um, I've certainly had that, that split where you, you might design a web-based experience rather than an, an app-based experience uh, to make it more accessible, um, economically speaking. But I think also it's just something that it's reflecting the wider culture. It, that divide and that difficulty exists in the wider culture as well. So expecting it not to exist in our context would be weird. 
Yeah. Thank you. A Adrian. Everybody nodded their head at the same point in there, so I, I can tell that everybody has something to say. Well, it's interesting because part of the research that we did in the funding for Trail Off was actually, so I actually think that immersive theater is an incredibly inaccessible art form. It's like the cultural barriers, the knowledge barriers, like the, I mean, there are so many barriers beyond just price um, that actually like the case we made was that by putting it on a phone and allowing people to do it when they wanted relatively where they wanted, it's actually making the form of immersive theater significantly more accessible. Um, and we can also be much more transparent. And in the case of Trail Off, people can do part of the experience and come back. You know, like if they have like a childcare emergency, they don't like blow. Also, it doesn't cost anything. Um, and so there are lots of ways that, yes, there is a, a technology that is required, but I would make the case that the technology is more accessible than all of the ways that the art form in its like quote unquote traditional format are not. Um, I'd say for um, the projects that we're working on with Groundworks and Toaster Lab is, is um, specifically cultural barriers, even just selling the idea to the people that we're working with. And um, you know, the, the concept of even understanding how this all functions sometimes is um, just people don't really understand it, um, especially within elders. And then there's also the cultural barriers of what we want to share and what we even want to share with each other or other tribal groups and how do we want to give access to that. Paul, you were working at the other end of yeah. technology from what we've talked about so far. How did that? Yeah, I, I would say on the spectrum, like I, I agree with everybody. I mean, there's so many different kinds of barriers to consider in designing mixed reality performance events. I mean, the 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 VR rigs that were required were not only not only did they require really expensive, you know, HTC Vive wireless adapter equipment, but they required the most state of the art kind of uh, graphics cards in order to drive um, the kind of like pro yeah the processing we needed. So um, huge barriers to accessibility. And it, and, and it was hot. And so it's, they kept and it's going hot. down. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean like literally in that yeah, right. room, it was well, warm. So I mean, yeah, it was hot. I mean, it was so hot that by the end of the seventh day, we were down three stations because the technology just couldn't cool itself. Um, you know, we, we, yeah, we lost three rigs. Um, progressively, so we kind of started with four, and then we, you know, just we ended up with one that held on right to the end. <laughs> but I mean, that was unexpected as well. And of course, I mean, we, you know, we could talk about like technical bugs or up, small updates that cause havoc uh, in terms of the programming or scripting. Um, but I was also thinking a little bit in terms of how we design experiences. Uh, you know, in terms of like mobility, um, cultural accessibility, but mobility truly, I mean, um, you know, how do, we, how do we make these really immersive experiences accessible to everybody who might, wh where, you know, we're trying to explore new ways of interacting with the body or being embodied in certain ways. Because for, for us, I think that was the most exciting aspect is, you know, playing with the technology and the apparatus, but also awakening or trying to find new ways of knowing things within our embodied presence. And that is not a, there's not, not a shared, um, there's not a, a rule book on what it means to be embodied. <laughs> it's, you know, it has to be explored and not just dramaturgically, but, you know, yeah, in, in every aspect. So we were attuned to those things, certainly by the time we got to the end of the technical fiascos with everything. But, and a significant amount of sponsorship, which is really challenging for... Um, yeah, for everyone. It's really challenging to find good sponsorship um, who believes in uh, projects that are not going to be um, making some kind of commercial capital gain. <laughs> like, it's art. <laughs> it's never, you know, done well that way, so. I wonder if I could flip the question around a little bit for you, Megan, and, and talk about it from a programming perspective and some of the barriers that you run into when you have a lot of, you're seeing a lot of projects emerging and you're looking at how those fit together within like a larger program and, and, and how you see the, those, those questions of technology or financial or uh, expertise access. Yeah, well, um, so like this year we had, uh, we had a whole bunch of pieces that were on Oculus Go, 
and we were like, we don't have access to that. Um, so we actually had to beg and borrow for just to be able to show the pieces, which was really interesting because, um, so before I came on, we, Imaginative had commissioned something called 2167, which was four pieces by different indigenous artists to show in a VR 360 film space, you know, what would the world look like um, for indigenous people in the year 2167. Um, it was done like for the bicentennial, like the you know, 150 years from now, what would things look like? Um, and that was like a technolo technological nightmare, but also what happened was we were like, oh, we wanna make it as accessible as possible. At the time, most accessible as possible was the VR gear because you could send the headsets and the phones. And within two years, it became just impossible to send that out because it didn't just need the headsets, it needed like qualified people to run it, which was like a huge mm -hmm. expense. And also this year, early in the spring, we had a whole bunch of people who were like, oh, we, we just want to download it. And we're like, and I had been saying, yes, like let's just set it up that way. And our programmer was like, yes, let me set it up that way. And our ideal, I basically the only one in the room who understands like VR tech, computer tech, that kind of stuff. So when I say stuff like that, they're still thinking very much from like a film standpoint, but also looking at this technology as like, I don't know how to handle it. So that's also another thing, like accessibility is, is more than just like getting people in the room. It's also the people who are making decisions about the things being made, mm -hmm. understanding the thing, or at least trusting the person who understands. Uh, yeah, so then we had, with the download question, I finally got my, my executive director to relent and said yes, and then they're like, okay, great, I would like it for the riff. And we're like, we only have it for the Gear VR, and I don't know if anybody knows what it's like to deal with Oculus and how you need to have a separate build for every, which I don't understand. <laughs> like, it feels like it should be able to just work on all of them. Um, so we're like, so I was like, fine, I'll, we'll put together a VR, a riff build, and, and they're like, and yeah, this is Oculus Go. And I'm like, I thought I really had my thumbprint on things. And I was like, <laughs> Oculus what? Uh, and then, because I had heard about the Quest, I totally missed the Go was a thing, uh, which is great because it just been uh, decommissioned. So, <laughs> clearly I learned about I'm it. I'm so glad we invested in I know. an inventory Same here. Up here. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, I was like, okay. And I went and I got a quote from a programmer, what do it cost? Because it's not that much to refactor because it was all built in Unreal. Um, so we're like, it shouldn't take that long. And it was like a couple hundred dollars. And my boss was like, oh, I didn't know we had to pay extra. And I was like, ah. Uh. So yeah, that's the other thing. Like accessibility with tech is about keeping up. And there's always going to be those like inf um, infusions of cash into buying a bunch of tech for arts groups. And it's always going to be off from each other. And it's always going to be the newest thing. But again, because there's nobody there who really understands the technology. And I really don't feel like arts organizations that give the funding are doing um, or helping arts organizations without having somebody there to be like, OK, so what do you want to do with this money? You want to buy VR? OK, let's look at what's going on. Like, Have somebody available who's knowledgeable about the trends and what's going on. Like. We were gonna, Imaginative was going to buy a bunch of Go's and then I was like, don't, because like, it's just got, and I, and I only found out because I know somebody who knows somebody at Oculus. Mm. And then the announcement came out like a week later. But it's like, we could have put in that, we would have put in that, that arts grant and then what we were gonna do afterwards, like tell them like, no thanks. And then, or I know they wouldn't have been so upset if we just bought in like, Quest. Right, but that, that's definitely a challenge within any yeah. arts project is you, you write the grant for what you say you're going to do and then you, if that technology shifts because it's a technology different project, like whether or not, depending on the fund and who, who the funder is, whether or not you can actually make that shift because some of them are like, you said you were going to do this, so you have to do this versus like, well, the technology is advanced. It's yeah, a, and that's also the problem with the tech companies. Like, I don't think they realize how much they hobble themselves by constantly flipping over stuff. Like, how can you build up a library if you're constantly putting out something new? So uh, yeah, I just, I feel like Oculus's decision to like run ahead with mm -hmm. like go and then cancel and then go into Quest, it was like, do you want libraries? Do you want people to buy your stuff? You're gonna to have to wait around longer than two years. <laughs> right, right. Adrian, did you wanna add something? I wanna open it up to questions. I was just gonna yeah. say that I think actually like that this, this question of like building a plan um, and then having the capacity to change really speaks to accessibility. I mean, one of the things actually that's been the best about working with the Pennsylvania Environmental Council is they don't talk to me very much. <laughs> like, 
and I mean that in the best way. Like I think probably many of you have experienced partnerships where you have somebody who isn't really knowledgeable about the work. Their expertise is in somewhere else. They want your expertise to bring a skill set into their realm, and then they have a million opinions about how you do it, <laughs> and then they refuse to allow you to learn anything or in an order of capacity. And one of the things that's been great about working with these writers is they're really strongly opinionated humans. And I think had we not, had I had a partner who wasn't able to hear me when I say like, this writer just needs a different process. Like she's a Sudanese refugee, her family member was killed, she needs two extra months to write her story and that's just the truth. And like being truly accessible to different perspectives also means working in ways that are different than the way we set out to and that learning is as much the work as the outcome. And if we can't be an honest collaborative processes, then we then why are, then then we're not actually collaborating, we're dictating. So Great. thank you. I did want to open it up in our uh, last few minutes here before we get to our next coffee. If there are any questions out there in the audience, there's a Scarlett's over here with a mic. Hi, um, my question's for Paul. I remember you had mentioned that you had um, very little trouble with motion sickness um, in your experience. Um, can you talk about like how one might avoid that? Because that's definitely a concern when I make my own. Uh, yeah, it's uh, I mean, okay. I mean, it's a broad statement, like to say that nobody had any issues, and certainly people did. But there was a sort of um, what we found astounding was that in the in the experience, they would keep coming back to sort of. Um, realized that it was something that was very tangible that they could sort of overcome. So there's a, there's a difference between being completely turned off and, you know, I'm not going to do that, or I, I feel invested in this narrative journey or this dramaturgical process or the aesthetic environment that I'm engaged in enough to want to come back and try and sort through the kind of counter currents that are running through my physiological body telling me other things. Um, so there are some, like, common best practices, like avoiding locomotion, for example. Um, at certain velocities that are just really good best practices. But you know, okay, for example, you know, we put people in a two and a half meter pool of sand and then we lifted them up some 30 meters in the air very slowly and we moved them locomotively to the center of the stadium and then we burst them through the roof until they were in, you know, basically the ether. Uh, it seemed to work. <laughs> and it seemed to work quite nicely. Nobody vomited, <laughs> you know, and it seemed to work because probably the kinds of imagery, the kind of grounding um, compositional music, so all of the elements that were in, in play, uh, and so in the velocity, but I would say more than anything, is just a sensitivity within the creative team to sort of think about those things and prototype them within the rehearsal hall. It sort of comes back to a kind of question, you know, question of how do we design experiences or what do we have to do differently in order to incorporate technology uh, into, you know, especially scripting, for example, which takes a lot of time to see if the velocity of this elevator lifting up is at the right speed in order to avoid kind of some kind of nausea reaction. So it has a lot to do with taking a different kind of approach in terms of the rehearsal build or how one goes through that process. Um, but also it has a lot to do with how the body feels a certain physical um, grounding within the environment because it's mixed reality. So the fact that people were barefoot in the sand gave them, as I mentioned, a, a way of being unstable at first, but then a sort of extreme familiarity to be able to even, let's say, use your toes to root down and to try and like really engage in a different way with the environment. So that was also a, like a, a real interesting yeah, thing that happened. But yeah, thanks for the question. That's interesting, yeah. Thank you. Um, we've got time for one more, center, center here. This sort of starts from something that Tasina said, but uh, open to everybody. Uh, the question of uh, getting coding skills into the minds and hands and you know bodies of people who have not traditionally been the people we, we see as technologists. I'm just wondering, do you have um, ideas of, of strategies and, and ways forward for that? Um, I don't necessarily, um, but I do think that um, in, in Introducing this in, within Native community to, with the young people and, and showing them um, 
what they normally wouldn't have access to. And then also, um, I know that within one of the people that we work with, um, Ross Kiddy, he works with media programs, and one of the things that he just started doing was an indigenous hackathon. Um, so it's basically introducing Native people to these very, very introductory ideas of how to even be exposed to this type of media. Because honestly, like I, even the youth that I know, their, their minds would probably be blown by seeing what people are working on here, because they don't even know that it exists. Um, and also entering into the gaming culture that is really prevalent with the youth. I have strong opinions about this. Mostly because I work with a lot of like um, can code, not can code specifically, but groups like that. Um, and th there's been a, like a lot of, uh, I don't want to say harm, but I would say uh, maybe, you know when you're like too ready to do a thing? Uh, I've been seeing a lot of that, where you have a lot of these non-Indigenous groups that are kind of running into, getting a lot of money and then running into these like Indigenous communities to be like, I'm gonna slam code down your throat, you're gonna love it. Uh, and it's it's not, again, it comes down to the protocols, but it's also, um, I, don't, I don't feel like a lot of these groups are coming in um, because like, code is important to them. Sometimes it feels like they come in because code is the hot new thing. Uh, and so for me, as somebody who like really enjoys doing code, it's, it's always kind of really upsetting because I don't see them starting with the basics. So for me, basics started without even a computer. It was learning logic and writing out stuff on paper. And I, like for me as a game designer, everything starts with paper. And so I guess for me, one of the techniques I would like to see being used, not just in indigenous communities, um, which I think also should be a community thing, not just a youth thing. I, I do also have very strong feelings that maybe the fact because like, uh, Cree uh, and Métis are very much about intergenerational sharing. So for us, it was always that weird feeling of like, we're only gonna go in for the youth, and you're like, but why? Like, grandmas like to do stuff, like, you know, Kokum can code, <laughs> like, let her code. <laughs> uh, but also, I would like to see less focus on getting kids right in, on screens, and first, like, let's build up that knowledge base of, you know, how does a computer think? What are bytes? Like, I had a very interesting conversation with Monique Monach about, so a lot of um, indigenous languages in like the north, uh, so like Canada and the north US, uh, have very strong concepts of uh, animate and inanimate. And I said, code, like, code makes a lot of sense and bytes make a lot of sense because binary is essentially, it's either on or off or it's dead or alive. And so all of a sudden she was like, oh my God, yes. And that's why it's always like made so much sense. And so the language of code can make a lot of sense to indigenous people just because binary, at least like, the, like Anishinaabe and Cree is a lot of animate, inanimate. So it makes a lot of sense, but you don't see, I don't see groups coming in from that point because they're kind of rushing in with a very like, uh, American college idea of how code should be taught, mm. uh, which is like, yeah, it's not even a European idea. It's a very like American college, like MIT, like we're gonna like get you on these computers where it's like, let's start real slow. Let's start at the base. Yeah. It's not um, code specifically, but I think one of the things that's been, I'm not like a, I'm not the front wave of digital technology ever, which I think is like the funny thing that I keep getting involved in these tech projects in part. <laughs> um, and I think it's sort of like, I don't know, I'm also a person who's trained in game design, and I think that there's like a small group of people mostly who are at the forefront of a technological advance designing games. And if you imagine like where movies would have been if only a small subset of people who are interested in action movies made films, like you wouldn't be accessing the full potential of that medium to communicate. And one of the things that's been really interesting about working with the writers for Trail Off is that they think about place-based storytelling really differently than somebody who's like a geocacher. And, and their interaction with space pushes, I think, the conversation in a different way, oftentimes in like really difficult hard ways, but in ways that like expand my thinking about what storytelling can be, in part because they're not coming from it 
from the same perspective, so. I would completely echo that. I would say this is an opportunity um, to have completely new collaborators in the room. I mean, we don't, okay, <laughs> some, most of the time, we don't expect the actors on stage to be, you know, programming the moving light board in theater, in theater environments. Um, okay, sometimes it happens a lot. But, but it, it, it really is, it's a, it's a very deep subset skill that requires a high degree of, you know, specialization um, and scripting is, you know, incredible with interactive aspects. So, um, it's, but you know, and it's really hard to find those people who want to not work in mainstream or find someone in terms of, uh, you know, our programmer uh, who works in the mainstream gaming environment, but then who wants on the side to do some more art things, <laughs> you know, so convincing them to come over and play. And for them, you know, at least in, in, the, uh, in, in the case of Richard, who was our programmer, he found an immense amount of joy and, um, uh, you know, a totally different outlet in order to be able to create at an artistic level. Um, so, you know, it's these new fantastic collaborations and him in the room also offering up possibilities that we would have never imagined uh, because he is such a specialist. So, uh, like, I think it's a whole bunch of new collaborative players all of a sudden and it's exciting and nerve-wracking at the same time, so yeah. Um, Jacob, I want to hold time if you have a quick thing. Otherwise, nope. otherwise I'm going to thank our panelists. Uh, for participating in this session. Uh, we're gonna take a break now. There's gonna be, there should be fresh coffee outside. Uh, and we'll come back in about 15 minutes uh, to go to our third and final panel for the day. Thank you very much.